Hi, I'm Pakolo Koko, the founder and president of The Runway. Welcome to The Runway Replays, where we bring you gems in the form of recordings from our past online events. All our activities and programs are specially designed to set you up to soar to become the best version of you. I hope that you enjoy the following recording and that you continue to engage with us. to great teas now <laughs> and you can yeah. hear a bit more about um your transition from i guess being a student first of all to being a doctor and then mm -hmm. i guess being a student in china with your experiences to then working in botswana and just how that's been for you i know it's been two years now and you did mention okay. maybe that you had to do some catching up could you maybe yeah go in depth a bit more about that transition for yourself Okay, so when you start work, we, we are divided into international medical graduates, so IMGs and UB students. And then, you know, we apply through MITP, which is the Medical Internship Training Program in Botswana under the Ministry of Health to become interns. And they deliberately place us in pairs. So you find that when we came, so I'm stationed in Maung. When we came to Maung, they put six of us and it was three UB students and three international medical graduates. And this is deliberate in the sense that, um, as you said, when Aludo, in the UK, you get exposure as early as first year. Same goes with UB students, but for them, it's um, an even better advantage because they're working within the system. They know how things work. They know how the system works. So um, I think the, the decision to put us in pairs was just for us to get acclimatized faster, to adapt quicker, knowing that they already know the system and they already know how things work and they can help us sort of um, catch on a lot faster. So that was very helpful. It, initially, it felt a little bit intimidating because obviously you have no clue how things work, literally to the level of just knowing, like we have an, an online system where we just sort of um, keep the data of our patients in and we just sort of update that. You don't even know how that works when you get here for the first time. Uh, you don't know where to get stuff. You don't know what drugs are available. There's all those dis uh, discrepancies. So it was quite, um, quite a lot to learn in a very short space of time because we started an internship but we needed to be competent as interns on the spot. And then we had this um, backlog of stuff that we still needed to catch up on. So I think just having the, the UB students um, to sort of guide us at peer level was a very helpful, helpful strategy. But other than that, to be honest, um, there's just a lot that you have to do on your own. I think it's just realizing your own strengths and weaknesses, realizing the gaps and filling those gaps by yourself. Lots of studying, obviously in medicine, you never stop studying. Um, the system is supportive. There are a lot of people who are always willing to teach, uh, especially people who are fresh out of school as well. People who understand um, the pressures of sort of catching up and transitioning into your role as a medical officer. You have people who are generally just very passionate about health academics and are willing to to teach and to you know get you on board so it was a very gruesome process just because I was so far behind in terms of everything that I had to learn in such a short space of time but the system is supportive and the the, the, the process of growth is very organic I should say and before you know it really you're just um, you're at a place where you feel like you're, you're, you're confident and you're competent and you can do this yeah Thank you so much for that. Um, quite a few people have just joined us. So if you just joined us, welcome. Um, we are here with Dr. Aonit Tira, who's talking to us about her experience as a medical practitioner in Botswana. She studied in China. You missed the intro bit, so I'll just feed you in on that. And she's just spoken to us about her experiences as a medical student and how she transitioned from being a student to a medical practitioner. Also, if you are just joining us, welcome again. Drop in the chat box where you are based and what year you're in. Um, we've got quite a few people here, so we'd love to engage. If you do have any questions for Aone as well, um, please drop them in the chat box. I'll keep an eye on them. Um, but mm -hmm. if I don't get to them, we will have a Q&A session after everything, of course. And you can just switch on your mics and ask the question. Also, the session is being recorded. 
Um, if you are uncomfortable, please just drop that in the chat box as well and we'll stop recording at any time. Thank you very much. So um, you spoke a bit about like having to apply. Um, could you mm -hmm. tell us a bit about that application process? Like, is it, do you write on a paper? Do you know, do, is it online? <laughs> How long does it take to get yeah. feedback? Do you have, what choices do you have? And things like that. Okay. So just to get this um, out of the way, I don't know if things have changed much. I applied in 2019. Obviously, there's now COVID going on. I, I would hope that they've tried to move, they've tried to move a lot of things online, but I'm not sure. But the first thing that you'd need to do is um, get registered and licensed with BHPC. So BHPC is Botswana Health Professions Council, and it's really just a governing body for medical, international medical graduate, local medical graduates, just a sort of like a. Um, uh, qualifications authority that just sort of looks through your qualification and makes sure that it's legit, it's from an accredited facility and that you're competent and that your qualifications are authentic and that you can practice in a safe manner. Um, to apply for that, there's a list of documents that you need. Unfortunately, I didn't get the time to sort of gather those today, but I think they should be readily available online. They do have a, a website, basically just your degrees, your diplomas, your IDs, of course, your transcripts, um, a few recommendation letters from university. Once you have been licensed by BHPC, then you can apply to the Medical Internship Training Program, MITP, which is under, uh, I think now it's been moved to UB. It used to be under the Ministry of Health, but I understand now it's, it's under the University of Botswana. Uh, you, for MITP, there's five main hubs, if I am not mistaken. So you have the Khabarone Hub, which is primarily Princess Marina Hospital. You have the Francis Town Hub, which is Nyangago Referral Hospital and Lutola Taba the Second Memorial Hospital. That's in Maung. So Maung falls under the Francis Town Hub. Then you have um, Mahalape, Pala uh, Mahalape, Serowe, and Molapolole. So Mahalape is just Mahalape District Hospital. Serowe is Sokoma Memorial Hospital and Mal Malapolole is Scottish Livingston um, Memorial Hospital. So those are the main hospitals that you can do your internship in. You are allowed to select your top three choices, but you are not guaranteed to get those. Um, I did get my first choice, but I do know people who, who didn't get the first choices. Once you've been uh, accepted into the MITP program, then you need to apply to the permanent secretary of the Ministry of Health and Wellness for a post as a medical officer intern. Um, then there's just basically the due diligence that the ministry does just to make sure that you're eligible to be permanent and pensionable. And then, yeah, you're posted, you report for your post and you start work. So that's the application process. As of 2019, I don't think it's changed much. Um, so yeah, that's basically it. And how long did it take for you to hear back? Like how long was the whole stretch of the process? Um, so if you complete your, your, your if, you, if you graduate by July, July, August, then you are in a good place because the UB students graduate in October. So around October, the BHPC people, the MIT people are expecting an influx of applications. So those students usually get everything done pretty quickly. Literally, you apply for BHPC. BHPC was a bit of a drag, especially for us international medical medical graduates, because they needed to do, you know, they needed to, to really just go through our documents thoroughly. I think there's been a, it's been getting more intense, I should say, especially for for, for China, for Russia, just because there's universities that sort of don't um, meet the requirements of the standards set by BHPC. I've had people who've, I've, I've heard of people who've had to go back to the embassies and get like supporting documents and that sort of thing. And very recently, you know, BHPC has been considering um, working under ECFMG, ECFMG is the Educational Commission for Foreign Medical Graduates, just to help them sort of assess if people are eligible or from the right universities to practice. So I should say it's getting more intense for 
the the less popular universities which is why i should just um squeeze this in that you know for anybody who knows somebody who's trying to get into medical school it's very important to make sure you get into university that is recognized accredited registered in the world directory of medical schools um, but yeah i've digressed so the, the process is pretty quick if you graduate around that time as i said i'm not sure how much longer it would take if you because i know that people who graduate in in January, February, but if you graduate in July, you're good. BHPC shouldn't take more than a month. MITP is very quick and posting is usually within a month as well. Okay. So yeah, I, I, I came back August and I was working by the 2nd of September. That's quick. I didn't yeah. expect that. So um, mm -hmm. you guys all start at different times then. It's not like all the medical, the new medical students like start like in January the 1st. It just depends on when you got applied. Initially, there was there were two intakes, so one in Feb and one in September. But I think they phased out the Feb intake. So even if you graduate in Feb, you'd probably need to wait for the following September to apply. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Okay. Um, question. So I know the system. Like, obviously, I'm based in the UK, so I know the system here pretty well. Like, we graduate and then we go. Yep two years of training and then we have to specialize but I'm not really aware of what that looks like in Botswana um so if you know mm. anything are you okay to tell us what after our heads are like you graduate you apply you're posted you know where you're going what role are you assuming what responsibilities do you have okay so this is as an intern or now as a medical officer I don't even know, just after you graduate. I'm assuming that's an intern, like okay. after you graduate and you've applied and you've been accepted and you are posted like Oko Maung and you are Okay. Fed. All right, so now you're an intern, you have to complete 48 weeks of clinical rotations. So the four main um, departments you have to rotate in are pediatrics and that encompasses general pediatrics and neonatal care. You have to do internal medicine. You have to do surgery. So surgery is um, both general surgery and orthopedic surgery, um, neurosurgery as well. And then you have to do um, OBGYN. So those are, those are the four primary departments you have to rotate in. In each of them takes twelve weeks, meaning at the end of at the end of your rotation you should have forty eight weeks of clinical rotations. Okay. Um, you have a logbook that you're given. I think I should have it close by. So you get something like this. Yeah, I don't think it shows. It's basically just a booklet with lots of procedures and presentations and lots of academic stuff that you just need to complete within an allocated time. And then that gets signed off by your consultants or your residents or whoever is just senior to you. And eventually it gets signed by um, and the MIT coordinator at ministry level and as well as a UB, and that's how you now qualify to become a medical officer. When you become a medical officer, you, for some people, if you're lucky enough, you get to choose. So this is if your target in medicine is to obviously specialize, you get to choose, okay, I'm trying to maybe become a surgeon. You then get stationed in general surgery. Or if you're trying to become a pediatrician, you're stationed in peds. Um, you work there, you work there for about whatever, depend, I think this is very, it's, it's personal, it's, it's subjective, because Botswana doesn't have, as you said, it's not like the UK where, or the US where immediately after you graduate, you train for a bit, and then you match into residency, and then you specialize. Mm -hmm. Here, it's up to you. Some people go on as MOs, as medical officers forever. There's, there's lots of those in the system. Some people specialize almost immediately. Some people specialize up to two, three years because that's what um, the government supports for, for scholarship. Like you have to wait about two, three years before the government can send you off to specialize. Mm -hmm. But basically you will be placed or you will get to choose a station in which you want to work in to gather the experience in preparation for your specialization training. So basically that's how, that's how it works. Okay. Okay. So you're currently an MO. Yes, I'm okay. currently a medical officer and I work in the neonatal unit. Okay. So is that like something that you'd like to specialize in? Is that where your passion is? If you don't mind. Yes, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, yes, hopefully. Okay. Um, so I'm going to just be asking questions so that we can get more information out of that's it. Fine. <laughs> that's okay. Um, no so problem. You mentioned, um, a lot of people like stay MOs or are MOs while they're waiting to like be sent away by the government to specialize. Um, does like, mm. 
obviously Botswana has a medical school. Does it offer any specialities that you can train for in Botswana, like in-house? Or do you always have to um, go yeah. Do you know? Okay. So, yeah, so UB, as, as far as I know, I stand to be corrected, offers pediatrics. Although the last two years would need to be done in South Africa, just because, as you might know, UB is not yet accredited. So the, the, the remaining two years of pediatrics are done in South Africa. I think anesthesiology as well, I stand to be corrected, but they have lots of information on their website. It's uh, a quick Google search could get, could get uh, you guys the answers. But yeah, I know they have peds, they have OBGYN, and they have anesthesiology. I think they have pathology um, and they do have public health um, and family, family medicine as well. Lovely, okay. Um, yeah. that. I had no idea at all. <laughs> um, yeah. So you chose to study, well, you chose to practice in Maung. Uh, Kantele, you said mm-hmm. for obviously tourism, of tourism. Is that like the only primary reason that you decided to go to Maung? Okay, so when I graduated, obviously I was very nervous because I knew that um, I wasn't where I'd, I wanted to be in terms of clinical skills. So I did my research. Luckily, I had my seniors who also went to China who are now practicing and integrated into the system. Um, and what I found out was that, okay, from the, the five places that were offered, I knew that there were places that were very intense, um, especially the referral hospitals. So that's Nyangagwe, Scottish, and Marina, obviously. Marina is the biggest public hospital in the country. It's very overwhelmed, overpopulated. There's lots going on. So I knew that I was going to be under a lot of pressure. It would have been near impossible for me to sort of catch up, as I've explained, and also function at the level they would have needed me to function at. Um, So I had to be selfish. I had to think for myself. And I decided Maung because I knew it's a district hospital. It's got less doctors. That was going to be a good and a bad thing. A good thing in the sense that I would have had more responsibility. I would have had a sense of independence um, because I would have been expected to do things and function independently. And that would have made me more confident. Um, And a bad thing because obviously less human resource means more workload. Um, I also felt like a smaller hospital would have um, allowed my seniors more time to be interactive with me, to teach me more, uh, to have the patience to teach me. Cause I can, you can just imagine a fast paced hospital versus, you know, a slightly slower paced hospital. I just think people are happier. People have more time, you know? So um, it was definitely a, a conscious decision to come here. Cause I, I knew that it, it was going to be a lot of work and a lot of pressure, but nowhere near as much as in the capital, in, in Khabaroni. Yeah. So, yeah, that's why I came here. Perfect. That's another reason I came has, here. Has yeah. it paid off? Like, have you, did you manage to learn things? Absolutely. Ab- absolutely. Like, I literally went from wobbling knees to superhuman. It's, it's, it's an amazing thing. And it's not just me. A lot, of, a lot of other people that now that I'm an MO, I have interns who are under me that I also get to mentor. I have people who've been to China, Cuba, who are faced with the same challenges where they didn't have as much exposure. And it's been about three months since they started, three, four months maybe. And they have a similar story to share. Like, it's just a very magical process how you can go from being completely you know, nervous to actually being able to save a life. Sounds amazing. Sounds mm. amazing. Um, I did have a question as well um, around that. So you said that obviously you weren't as confident in the beginning and it took a lot of work for you to get to a point where you were able to be confident enough, I guess, to do things on your own without second guessing yourself. Yeah. Um, I know this is like personal and it's based on you as an individual, but how long did it take for you to get to the stage when you like where you were confident enough to, I guess, walk around like a superhero? Uh, I don't know. It's like with medicine, you can never get there. Like you always need to be learning. You always make a mistake. There's just no avoiding that, but at least to get to a place of competency, to a place where I could sort of, be able to explain why I took a certain management route and not the other. I would say it, it took the full length of the internship program. By the time I was done with my internship, by the time I'd rotated in all the four main um, departments, I was at a place where I felt like, okay, I, I, I have an idea of what I'm doing. But I have to say, 
uh, you can never be too comfortable and I don't think you should ever be too comfortable. I think medicine is one of those careers where you always have to stay on your toes. You always have to learn what's new, um, what has changed, how you can improve. Noted, noted. Um, yeah. Got a question from Hui Tone and I'm just going to read it out. Um, we've got two questions actually. I'll start with the first one. So it says, apart from the two years as an MO, is there any other criteria to qualify for the government sponsorship for speciality training? Um, so, so the two years can actually be your internship year plus your one year of being an MO. I, I recently found that out. So you don't actually have to be an intern and then wait two years to be specialized. I've, I've, I've seen some people get specialized, uh, get, sponsored immediately after graduating from, from internship and working, excuse me, and working for a few a few months. So the two years is not set on stone. I've, I think it also depends how many people have applied for whatever course you're applying for. Um, other criteria from my research, I think it might be beneficial to write your primaries. So if you're trying to do OBGYN, um, pediatrics, I'm not sure about others, but those two I'm certain you can work on your part ones, which are your preliminary examinations that the University of Botswana recognizes, that puts you at an advantage. I don't think it's mandatory, but it definitely puts you at an advantage of getting um, accepted. Other than that, it's just um, employment stuff like this Honolulu PBRS, performance based review system. You need about two of those to qualify for sponsorship. Um, I think that's all I can think of from the top of my head. But other than that, it's just applying. And I think it's a good question because previously a lot of people used to wait years before they could specialize, four, five, six years, because the idea back then was that was that the more senior people need to go specialize before you. But I think specialization is a very subjective thing. Some people just don't want to go specialize. And uh, I think it's I should really encourage all of us to specialize early, like as early as you can just apply, try your luck because uh, people have been getting very lucky. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, on the topic of speciality, you said you wanted to specialize in like babies and other things. Yeah. Um, do you have an idea of where you want to specialize and do you get like the option? I know it's like a sponsor from the government. Do you get to choose where you want to go or are there, is there like a list of the places that you can choose from? Um, so I haven't been very proactive with the government sponsorship. I've been looking at different avenues. Okay. Um, but I do believe if you if you uh, if you're trying to get the government scholarship, they primarily take you to UB. I think I think that's what they've been doing, unless what you're trying to do isn't available in UB. But I haven't really done enough research around government sponsorships and and that sort of thing. I've just been trying other stuff. But I do think primarily they'll take you to UB. Okay. Is there a reason that yeah. you are trying other avenues over the government sponsorship? Or is it just personal? Uh, yeah, I think it's just personal. Okay. I think it's always been my plan since university. So, yeah, I just I just continued from that. Okay. Okay. Mm. Other question from from X. <laughs> uh, the question reads, I'm assuming you learned the medical terms and knowledge in Chinese. Do you find it hard to sort of translate that information into English or Setswana for patient documentation or communicating with a patient? Mm. And she's yeah, that, just curious as to what your process is. Yeah, so I did learn my entire course in Chinese Mandarin. I I wrote my exams in Chinese. I listened to lectures in Chinese. I had to speak Chinese in OSCEs and stuff. Um, yeah, that was, a, that was a huge part of my transition. So I had to literally learn the language of medicine from scratch. I always think back to one of the first meetings I attended. So you'd have a, a morning report, obviously after a night shift and you'd have to basically relay how your night went, who you saw and all that stuff. And there was this huge difference in how, you know, everybody else was reporting and how I was reporting just because I, I wasn't used to the language of medicine. I wasn't used to, and you think it's a small thing if you've learned in English, but if, 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 if all you've known in medicine has been Mandarin and, you know, a little bit of English from what you, what you were translating in school, then 
yeah, you'd see that it's it's a like the language of medicine is a huge part. I think it's a course of its own, really, just being able to converse scientifically. Um, so that's something that I missed out on as a student, and I had to definitely teach it to myself as an intern. Lots of studying, obviously. I think as an intern, that's where I really got to study in English alone, because as a student, I had to study in Chinese, go back to English, and then go back to Chinese to prepare for my to prepare for my actual exam. Uh, in terms of Setswana, Setswana is generally, I'm generally, I think I'm, I'm a, I'm a linguistic person, like I'm an artistic person as well. So languages have always been a strong point of mine. So it wasn't too, too difficult to learn how to sort of relay a message to, and to, you know, to, to patients in Setswana, our elder, our elder, our elderly patients who prefer to hear things in a language they understand best. Um, so yes, yeah, Zwana wasn't a huge problem, but the English, the English was a huge transition for me, just from learning in Chinese full time. Yeah, and uh, what resources did you use to like teach yourself? Um, so when you get here, there's lots of protocols, lots of guidelines that the country has employed, um, and of course, there's also lots of digital platforms that support. Um, medical education at student level, at um, doctor level. So I used all of those. I used online books. I used your Medscapes, your up to dates. Um, and as I said, there are guidelines that the the ministry has employed that are readily available. They circulate. People are readily um, ready to readily ready. People are ready to share um, share them with you on WhatsApp. You know, they're very easily accessible and. I think, yeah, they, they're good enough because they sort of let you know what you should do, when you should do it. And then you can go back home and, you know, read beyond the skeleton and just make sure you know exactly why you're doing what you're doing. But they are to the point and very easy to understand. So that's a lot of what I was using also just to catch up with how things are done um, in a book and in, in, in specifically in our setting. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. We've got a few more questions coming in, actually. Um... I'll read them again from David. David is asking, how satisfying is it to be a doctor in Botswana um, in terms of job satisfaction as well as rumination? Mm. Um, well, <laughs> I think if you look at all the work that we do, the hours, um, the sacrifice, it will never feel like enough, you know, but yeah, I think it's, I think it also goes back to comparatively how other countries pay, how um, other jobs pay, but it will never feel like enough. Just thinking back to the sacrifice that we make, especially in the background of um, a pandemic, it will never feel like enough. And I should say, I think, I don't know, but medicine will always feel like a huge sacrifice. You always feel like you're giving too much and receiving very little. Even if we were paid much more, I think you'd still feel like, you know, you're sacrificing a lot. I think it's it's one of those jobs where it's truly a calling, you know, you have to give more of yourself than you can ever be um, rewarded. And I think your biggest reward will just always be the satisfaction of knowing that you made a difference in a patient's life. Yeah, I agree. Mm. I agree, absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's a very you need to have passion and the desire as they yeah, all exactly. and I feel like mm -hmm. when you're in medical school you don't really see that until you actually like interact with patients and things like that yeah yeah exactly um, someone has asked about like how okay sensitive question but about how much you get paid um so i'll read the question yeah. word for word i've always been curious about doctors pay in botswana how much is it also is it mandatory to join the botswana doctors union so in terms of um the pay it's very easily accessible online as well i won't say it here if you guys don't mind i will divulge that at intern level you are c1 scale and at mo level you are d4 scale so i think if you're very curious you can just go and look up the how the scales in Botswana work and how much they pay and in terms of Botswana doctors union no it's not mandatory to um, join 
Um, yeah, it just depends on you. There are benefits. I'm personally not a member, but I have seen that there are benefits. I think they've recently been able to sign a memorandum of agreement with Stanbic Bank. So there's lots of benefits if you sign up with Standard Bank as a as with Stanbic Bank rather as a member of the Botswana Doctors Union. And yeah, generally they just sort of support us in issues that um, affect us on a daily basis as as frontliners, especially during this pandemic, they've been very active in um, advocating for us. Um, just to add on, do they support you like in terms of like, legally or is there like a specific body that would support like medical practitioners legally if ever there's a need? So if, if anything happens, if you're involved in a situation of malpractice or anything like that, the government covers you. The government of Botswana takes responsibility. So if somebody sues sues you for malpractice, they're actually suing the government of Botswana. Yeah. That's that's just how it works. So you, you do get subpoenaed as a doctor. Um, sometimes you are involved in a case where somebody, say for example, was driving and ran over somebody and maybe you collected bloods or you, you, you reviewed either the victim or the perpetrator, you'll be called to court just to say what you noted, um, just to be a witness. But initially, uh, essentially, you are under the protection of the government. Okay. Um, mm. So there's another question that reads, which office handles the sponsorship or like the sponsorship for specializing? Uh, that would be the Ministry of um, Health, Health and Wellness. Yeah, I think in conjunction with university, the University of Botswana, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, mm. so guys, if you guys haven't already noticed, we have started the Q&A session. So if you do have any yes. questions, <laughs> please just keep dropping them in. Um, you guys are asking very good questions. You're engaging very well. Thank you so much. Mm. Um, so we'll keep on with the questions for now. And um, if there's anything else to add, we'll do that towards the end. So we've got a question from Amy who says, all in all, coming to practice at home mm. after being in a foreign system, do you recommend it? I've heard some people say that they got bullied for being international students instead of going to UB. Mm. Any tips of what mm. to do or what not to do? Um, so the, okay, I think, I don't see the question unfortunately on my chat, but the first bit says, all in all, should you come back after yeah, after being yeah. trained internationally, correct? Okay, so I have to say, I don't know if this makes me less patriotic if I say it, but I have to say, if you find yourself in, you know, a country that is um, advanced in medicine, so UK, the US, Australia, those places, even South Africa, really, if you can, I honestly feel that you should stay if your target is to specialize just because the process of getting into residency, getting a registrar post and eventually becoming a specialist would be more linear, less of a hustle. And I'm saying this from experience because having come from China, trying to come, having worked here now and trying to go to other countries for me has been hell. It's a, it's, it's a very difficult process. Now you have to start from scratch. So if you want to eventually specialize, I think the best thing would be to stay where you are. I also have to say, although I'd, I don't know if I should be quoted on this, but um, I was a top achiever when I left high school and I didn't complete my A-levels and I went to China. So the top achiever scholarship essentially covers you from undergrad to PhD level. But because I came back from, you know, you know I took a break in my scholarship to come back and practice even though these were the requirements of Botswana that you have to become an intern for a year and then an MO, even though these are the requirements, when I tried to, you know, try and go back to school, I was told that because I took a break, I am no longer eligible to continue with my scholarship. So that's something, yes, that's something that's going around. Um, and I think, you know, if, if, if you want to specialize, you should do your research, just make sure you find out how coming back or taking a break is going to affect um, you getting responsive to continue or you sort of benefiting from your top achiever scholarship for any of you guys who might be under the top achiever scholarship to sort of continue with your with your medical education. So I think it works really well for American-based um, 
medical graduates because that program is sort of like a straight through thing. So you graduate, you finish your undergrad and then you match for residency and then you become a specialist. So for them, it's, you know, it makes, it makes sense for them to be sponsored right through. But I know, you know, other people, for other people, you'd want to take a break, work first. So I'm just really advising you guys to do your research and just make sure that, um, you know, your break is not going to affect you getting sponsored further because that's something that I've had to go through. Right. Um, yeah, I think the next part of the question was, can um, you repeat it for me yeah, on a little? Of Sorry. Course, of course. Um, she said, I've heard some people say that they got bullied for being international students and stuff. Can you be any tips on what yeah. to do or what not to do? So unfortunately, um, being a, an international medical graduate has carried a stereotype that a lot of people have um, unfortunately decided to run with. So I think it's just a thing of us being a little bit slow paced initially when you're finding your feet and you're just getting accustomed to you know, clinical work. With UB students, as, as, as early as third year, they're at the patient's um, bedside, they're doing procedures, they're given responsibilities. You know, they know the system in and out. They even know the stuff. You know, that's a that's a that's a, a a key part that I think we we take lightly. But just having a working relationship already with people, knowing the nurses by name and all of that, puts you in a better position. So when you come now from outside Botswana, you're studying work. You find these people who've already formed relationships with consultants. They're already known within the system. They know what they're doing. They know the ins and outs of the hospital. And then you are that clueless you become slow and then to be honest it it does always come off as incompetency other than that you have people who've come before us uh, from foreign countries unfortunately who haven't um, met the standards who haven't sort of um, been as hardworking as they should be so because of that it's just believed that and that's sort of where I think the bullying stems from uh what you should do and what you shouldn't do i think just work hard your work will always speak for you study um do what you need to do like make sure you know what you're doing i think there's no there's no other way around it just make sure you're studying and you know what you're doing you know you're you're, you're being very interactive um if you don't know something now, don't allow yourself to be embarrassed again the next day. Embarrassment is unavoidable. You will be embarrassed um, when you're starting off. There's stuff that you're not going to know. There's procedures you're not going to know. But just make sure it doesn't happen to you, you know, more than it needs to. Um, and just stay on your toes. Be teachable. Uh, be receptive. Be proactive. Um, yeah, and just put your best foot forward. I think your work will always speak for you. Yeah, I really like that. Your work will yeah. always speak for you. And you take yeah. on like a very hardworking um, person. So mm, I try. <laughs> you should tear you. a page from your book. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Una Lita. <laughs> Another question from X again. X Ari. You touched on some hospitals having more intense workloads than others, but what is the general work life balance like? How do you manage other hobbies and social life, ETC, especially also because you are a full-time mm -hmm. content creator on the side. Um, yeah. Okay, so um, I think, let me just say, let me just say, I think as an intern, I would encourage everybody to make that their priority, just making sure you get a grasp of the system. I'm not saying like, don't do anything else with your life. Like work life and work life balance is very important, but just make sure your internship year is your sacrifice year, or at least that's what I did. I just made sure, you know what, as an intern, um, I'll make sure that this is my priority and other things, you know, a little bit, but it's definitely doable. You know, the, 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 the schedule is tight. You're always, especially as an intern, you're always working. I think if on average MOs get three to four calls a month, interns are getting six, seven, eight sometimes. So you're working all the time. You're always tired. You're getting assignments from your seniors, your attendings and everything. You have to study your own studying plans. You have to, you know, maintain yourself because now you're an adult. You find that you now get placed so far away from your family. So you literally have to adult full time. You have to drive yourself, feed yourself, take care of yourself, just be a 
a whole human, a whole adult. So you have to do that with being um, an intern. So it gets it gets very difficult. And um, I had to be kinder to myself with not um, being super productive. Like I, I just took a, a, I let my hobbies take a little bit of a back seat because I knew that I needed to put my head into, you know, getting competent and getting comfortable as a practicing doctor. But you will have time to, to do what you love. You will have time and you should make time to do what you love. Um, especially if you get fortunate enough to be placed at a, in a place where, you know, you wanted to go, where you know you have stuff that you can do. So I know some people love gabs because, you know, you can, pre-COVID that is, you could have your nightlife, you could have your activities, stuff to do with your friends. Some people prefer Maroon because it's a touristic place. You know, people have their own preferences. So I think just make the time. You can make the time. Um, and I always say to people, no job under the sun is worth running yourself to the grave for. Not even medicine, to be quite honest. So make time for yourself. It's, it's definitely possible. If you can take a little trip, ever since um, the borders closed because of COVID, people have really just been discovering, rediscovering Botswana. So there's lots of stuff to do locally. Happy you'll be getting paid, Nyana. You know, there's really no reason for you not to spoil yourself. So yeah, I think it's just a thing of deciding consciously that you're going to create time and room to live a colorful life alongside being a competent doctor. Hello. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to drop one question before I move on. It's kind of along the lines of what was asked. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, at the runway, we kind of do advocate for mental health and taking care and protecting your mental health. And you're a medical yep. practitioner. You've spoken about the stresses and how difficult it can be and things like that. Um, how do you take care of your mental health, like as a practitioner, as a multifaceted woman, as a, a female, as a person who likes to do things? Okay, so um, I don't know if it still happens, but before you start your internship, there's two weeks that is organized by UB um, in Psychic Demon Training Ho Memorial Training Hospital. And it's sort of like a, a training for all the eligible interns. They call it the boot camp. And when we were there, they spoke a lot about mental health and how, you know, there's people who've fallen off, people who are now in um, in facilities because they couldn't stand with, withstand the pressures. Um, so from all those talks, I, I was I was ready for whatever was coming because I knew it, it probably had to be intense for us to be worn so much. Yeah. Um, and when I got on when I got into the field, I did find that there's just so much that at least for me, that you need to prepare me for. So even things as simple as breaking bad news to a patient or to a patient's family. Um, we didn't cover them uh, in detail in school. And then you have to face them uh, in real time, sometimes all by yourself. Oh. It gets overwhelming and you have nobody to speak to after that. It's just supposed to be a part of the system, a part of life. You have to keep it moving you know, and that's just sort of how everybody functions in a hospital setting. You just keep it moving. You just have to stay okay. You have to just stay on top of things. Um, nobody debriefs, nobody um, sort of discusses emotions um, in a work setting. So you have to do it by yourself at home in the morning, self-affirmations. I didn't realize I needed to until I was almost halfway through internship and I was just feeling so tired, so sad, so miserable. And I realized it's because I've just focused on functioning basically like a machine and not being in touch with my emotions, um, suppressing my emotions because I felt like I needed to and I had to and that's just the way things worked. So halfway through, and I'm so lucky that I, I got to it um, that early, I was just able to, you know, go into a mode of self-counseling where I was just like, as I, as I just said, I, I'm now of the notion that like, not even, no matter how passionate I am about medicine, not even that should um, put me in a position where I completely disregard my, my, mental, my mental health. So I started speaking to people, 
um, it's always difficult to speak to people because obviously um, with medicine, we are contractually bound and ethically bound with confidential information that we're not necessarily allowed to share. But just speaking to colleagues is a good place to start. Um, speaking to their seniors when you just feel like you've had enough, when you feel like you're burnt out, even just saying, you know what, I need a few days off. I think that's something that we're very afraid to do, especially as interns. We feel like, ah, oh, it's too soon for me. What makes us a the bayana? But you, you need to do it for yourself, just to say, you know what? I feel like I'm reaching a breaking point. I need a step back. I need a few days off. I need to gather myself. I need to, you know, rejuvenate and all of that. I think that's it's just a thing of being um, proactive and realizing that you do need to put yourself first and you cannot pour from an empty cup. For you to heal, you need to be healed. And that's just sort of the motor that I've been working from. Absolutely, I do love that. I do love that. Mm. Um, is the system and the people in the system supportive um, in that regard? Mm. To be quite honest, there's no, there's no proper like plan in place to address mental health. As an intern, you have um, an intern coordinator, an intern mentor. It is a bit helpful. Those are the people that are sort of, I, I guess, the idea is for them to be your your safe haven, people that you can um, confide in when things get tough. But uh, but there is no proper system in place. Uh, yeah, they do have counseling, but I've noticed that um, a lot of them are just there to to deal with patients and uh, the, the the healthcare workers are often neglected. Mm-hmm. So you, you don't really... Lena, you'd feel awkward to go and ask them for help because that's just not what you feel they're there for, yeah. you know? So it's just not something that's very well advocated within the system. Okay. Um, mm. Thank you again. We've had quite a few people join us. If you've just joined us, so welcome. Um, we're with Dr. Aonedi Tirwa. We've gone through the bulk of the introductions and we are just in the middle of a Q&A session. So if you've come with questions, I know you've missed quite a bit, but if you have any questions for our doctor here about studying and in an in international place and working in Botswana and how that has been for her. Drop it in the chat box. We've got quite a few questions, so we'll try to get through them quickly. I'll try not to jump in with my own. Um, <laughs> we've got a, a question from Sir Peter. Uh, since we have specialists who have trained way, way she left off. No problem. I do apologize. Oh, she's back. I'm back. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, you were in the middle of something, if you go right ahead. No, I was saying we'll continue because I know mm-hmm. still saying something. So I was saying we'll continue and then when you come back. Okay, perfect. We'll, yeah. 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 Um, I'm, you might need to take over now because I've lost the question. So if you read them out, that would be grand. Is that okay? Okay. Uh, you lost the questions. Okay, so... The other question was saying, um, what are the key differences between, I'm sorry about the noise, what are the key differences between Botswana healthcare system and the Chinese one, taking away the language and maybe lack of patient access as a med student, but the, by like the what? The level of care given resources, for example, being able to ask for a CT and get it ASAP. And lastly, how did you manage to adjust to these differences? Did you get that? Um, sorry, can can you repeat that? I'm having trouble. Okay. With my... Can you? I think the question is basically asking about um resources because the difference in resources and how how you've been able to adjust to that. Adding, what are the key differences between Botswana healthcare system and the Chinese one? Taking away the language and maybe lack of patient mm. access as a med student, but like the level of care given. Yeah, 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 yeah. And lastly, how did you manage to adjust to these differences? Mm. Okay, so yeah, you are right. I think this is from Sydney, is it? So stuff like CT, MRIs were literally like, yeah, literally just, it was as good as x-rays. 
back in China, but in Botswana, you schedule it and it's like uh, this huge list that people who have been booked for CTs last year, Jan, and they're still waiting for that date just because it's it's such a scarce commodity. And it's, of course, as you guys all know, Botswana is a, a resource limited country. Um, I haven't been able to feel the differences so much because as I said, in China, to be quite fair, we were not really part of the system. Like we, we weren't a part of the workforce like that. So this almost feels like a brand new experience for me. Like my experience as a medical officer in Botswana is my first real experience of being part of a working team as a doctor. So it wasn't very diff difficult to, to adjust. Um, can I add something to that? Yep. Um, but like also with the healthcare system, you know how in terms of documenting things are slightly different back home. I'm assuming in China yep. things are electronic like they are in the UK in yep. terms of just knowing patients, communicating with patients, it was slightly different. I know maybe you didn't mm. get access to like, you know, patients, but you could see how things were run. You yeah, could see how you yeah, yeah. things. Like, how is that yeah. different from back home? How are the supervisors, how, yeah. like things like that? How's, what's the difference? Yeah, so you're absolutely right. Like in China, everything is electronical. So you'd have um, the consultant working with, his medical officers, his, res his residents, his interns, his students with a, a little like iPad. And then, you know, whoever is on duty or writing that day would just be taking down notes and all of that would be updated on a computer. In Botswana, first of all, we like human resource. So you find myself as an intern or even as a medical officer doing rounds alone. And then maybe you're calling a specialist just to get like additions to how maybe they want to change or, you know, how to alter the management. Um, there are there are facilities that still do grand rounds with consultants and everybody else, but it differs from institution to institution. Um, here we write everything, pen and paper, huge files. And obviously that's a huge difference from abroad where, as you said, it is electronical. And yeah, there's just, it's different. It's all different, but I, 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 did, I did see how things worked abroad, but as I said, it didn't feel like a huge, a big thing to adapt from because I wasn't really part of the working system there. So I just knew, okay, this is how things work. You write everything down, you know, you're not, you're not always going to have access to your specialist. Um, we do even have wards in the hospital that don't have consultants. So we sometimes always have to refer to the next um, big hospital. For example, in the Tula Tebe, we don't have a general surgeon. So if we have emergencies that need a general surgeon, we refer to NRH. Um, so yeah, I think those, those are some of the differences. Hello? Yeah, okay. Um, okay. Let's see. Just a follow-up question. You mentioned Hore, that not, okay, there's lack of human resources and you don't have specialists. Because I want to know, for example, where I am, I'm in Cuba, there's mm -hmm. basically someone for every single thing. There's a yes. specialist down to angiology, there's specialists for mm. everything. Um, yeah. You get lab techs, you get um, people for x-rays cts and everything and those like when you go for example when you go and request the ct scan it comes back with the results all mm, you have to do the is report the report yeah mm. so i'm asking do you is, do they have something similar or you don't know, have to do everything like you have to know how to interpret an x-ray or a CT. you have to know yeah, yeah so so we don't even have radiologists in some in some institutions. So, for example, in Mau, if you get a CT, you need to know what the CT is showing you. You're not going to get a report with it. Um, you have to interpret it yourself. You need to document those interpretations, report those interpretations to other medical officers, other residents, other um, specialists. Um, we don't have somebody for everything. So even things, are, you, you are right, because I'm, I'm just reflecting back to the fact that we do have some Cuban specialists who, who we work with and they don't do certain things. When you ask them why they don't do certain things, they explain that back in Cuba, somebody there's somebody for everything, even somebody who bleeds a patient, somebody who cannulates a patient. So they don't do all those things. But in Botswana, you have to be able to do everything under the sun. Literally, you have to be able to 
you know, diagnose, do all the procedures. Um, recently, I was speaking to a colleague who works in Guyana, so Caribbean, South America, and he was explaining that they are not allowed to do cesarean sections as medical officers. As a medical officer in Botswana, you expected to do a cesarean section independently. So I, I guess that's, those are just some of the differences um, that you sort of have to adjust to. We can't hear you, my lovely. Um, we missed that. Is it me? Should I go again? No, no, no. I think Kifilo is trying to say something, but we can't hear her. Yeah. Oh, you can hear me. We can perfectly hear you now. <laughs> okay. I was saying, I was asking if you get to learn all these things during your internship year. Kind of the system doesn't allow you, doesn't give you enough time for you to learn all these things. You have to have learned them before, before graduation. No. You, like the system, to be honest, if you are willing to learn, the system will favor you. So you learn everything as an intern and you learn it so quickly, which will will surprise you even as an individual. So even like when a Woody sees that, you're going to learn them within your internship year. You start closing off the skin. Next thing you're closing the fascia. Next thing you know, you're delivering the baby yourself and doing the entire procedure by yourself. So internship year does offer an opportunity to learn, especially if you go to a facility that is not too crowded, as I explained, where um, there is space and opportunities for you to do things independently. You can imagine in a hospital where there's three residents in OBGYN um, and four medical doctors, obviously the residents need that practice. So it's going to be like a war, like who's got to get to the, to the procedure first. Yeah. So unlike in a, a setting where it's not so busy, not so crowded, there's space, you know, for everybody to sort of have a piece of the cake. Oh, yeah. Okay. Interesting. Mm. You keep mentioning um, there's a difference in the, the medical, the facilities, the different hospitals that take in interns. Could you like maybe do a quick breakdown of these five hospitals? That can maybe someone um, that can help someone make a decision. Somebody who's graduating and starting back internship, yeah, very soon, make a decision as to which hospital they can go to. Mm. Other factors, but yeah. To be honest, it wouldn't be fair of me to to do that because I don't have experience from other hospitals. Okay. I can only speak for my womb. Um, but I do have colleagues in, in, in these other hospitals. I think it really just depends. I think it's a very individual thing. It just depends on an individual's experience. So I really can't say don't go to Marina. Or some, so for some people, Marina is what they need, especially if you are accustomed to working at that fast pace and you know, you're know you really looking at um, specializing very early in your career. You know, because my, uh, because Marina is at a federal hospital, you get all the interesting, unique cases, unlike a mm -hmm. district hospital where we just get patients and refer, get patients and refer. So I think it's all very subjective and it just depends on your goals as an individual um, and, you know, your 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 priorities for your career. So I really can't give a, a very specific answer for that question. I think it just depends what, what exactly you're looking for and what your priorities are. Okay. Okay. Um, moving along with the questions, I had skipped a question here. Since we have specialists who have been trained abroad, abroad, sorry, do you think as a country you will see organ transplant services being introduced soon? And also, how is the state of medical research? Hmm. Um, I, I, I don't think I have the range to comment on the tran organ transplant services. I mean, mm -hmm. I hope so, but honestly, I haven't looked into that much, I don't know. But in terms of the state of medical research, I think it's definitely um, starting off. There's lots of um, there's lots of people who are going into residency now. And obviously as part of your residency, there's um, a thesis to defend and lots of people are getting into research and that sort of thing. There's also a lot of medical students now who are interested in becoming global health practitioners. And obviously a huge part of that is research. Um, and it's also a course that's offered by, by UB. So 
I think ever since establishing ever since establishing that a lot of people are are going into medical research as a as a field of work. Okay, that's good to get a bit of diversity. Also, mm. do you what do you know of maybe other employment opportunities that exist on the in Botswana that are besides yeah. being a, a medical doctor that one okay. like for for somebody who doesn't feel like practicing but they don't want to feel like they wasted seven years old I mean what if yes. <laughs> I'm so glad you raised that because now I feel like like you know that's I think that's a phase that a lot of doctors go through like what else can I do with my degree mm-hmm. and um unfortunately it's not it's not very well documented and not very well um researched and I think everybody has always just felt like you study medicine, you become a doctor. So I'm, I am a huge advocate for medicine beyond the hospital. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of opportunities in Botswana, I think to get to a place where you can diversify your options with your degree, you'd have to, you'd have to get, um, you'd have to go back to school. So for example, you can go into health management, but you'd need to do maybe a master's in health management, you can go into your global health, public health, um, which would take you to, you know, dealing with health at an organizational level, board, UNA, UNICEF, WHO, you know, that sort of thing. You can get into, um, I had a few written out, insurance organizations are now always actively looking for doctors, nurses. Um, so your, your, your compensatory funds, like road accident funds and those, that sort of thing. Um, health academics obviously becoming a lecturer now that the University of Botswana also is open uh, for medicine and for specialization you can get absorbed by the university to host some lectures so yeah there are opportunities besides just you know clinical working in a clinical setting but I do feel like to get there you would probably need to edify yourself a little bit more just to diversify yourself and I do think there'd be many more opportunities outside of Botswana uh, with your degree because obviously Botswana is an economy that's just starting to to bad so you might find that we are limited as compared to first world countries um yeah I think Una do you want to continue or um yeah I'll go ahead I'll read the question that I'm seeing here now yeah. um it's from Arato and it says, I hear you mention consultants, MOs, residents, and interns. May you break down how the hierarchy is structured and their individual roles in Botswana? All right, okay. So I'm gonna have to jot this down to remind myself. So I'll be glancing over the side a bit. Okay. So you have a, a hospital superintendent, right? Which is like the CEO of the hospital. And then under the hospital superintendent, you have the specialists. So what in other countries people call consultants. So you have them, um, first you have HODs of departments. So let's say in a hospital, the main departments are PEDS, um, surgery, broken down into the different surgeries. So neurosurge, orthosurge, and general surge. Then you have OBGYN, you have the anesthesiology team, and then you have the physician's internal medicine. Um, then of course, this is just a brief breakdown. So under PEDS, you're gonna have an HOD, which is usually a specialist, an HOD of PEDS, and then all the other specialists, which are the other consultants will fall under that. Under the specialists now, you're going to get residents, so people who are training to become specialists. Under residents, you're going to get MOs, general practitioners, medical officers. Under medical officers, you have medical interns, and under interns, you have students. So that's just how the hierarchy works. The student reports to the intern, the intern reports to the MO, the MO reports to the resident, the resident to the HOD, and the HOD to um, the hospital superintendent. Some hospitals have a chief medical officer who's in charge of all the medical officers. Um, This is also how calls work. So if you're on call call as an intern, um, some hospitals, actually call you from home. So you don't actually have to be based in the hospital. If you have a situation as an intern that you cannot handle, you call your MO. If your MO can't handle it, they call a resident. If the resident can handle it, they call the consultant. So that's also how um, the hierarchy works in terms of management of patients. I hope I've answered Arato's question. 
Yep, she's very thankful in the comments. Um, we've got mm -hmm. another question from X that I really like, actually. Um, just wondering from your experience and anything you might have heard from other female doctors, are there any gender biases or stereotypes that are perpetuated in the workplace? For example, mm -hmm. does sexism exist um, in the health sector in Botswana? Mm. I was actually quite surprised. I did expect a lot of sexism um, just because all along medicine has been, you know, um, a male dominated field. But I think that's definitely changing, especially in Botswana. There's lots of women doctors. So I think men simply don't have the opportunity to be sexist because there's just such an overwhelming um, number of females. What I, what I do think exists is um, just sort of the idea that women cannot do certain specialties, especially your, your more ortho search, just because it's so physical. So if you find yourself as a female in ortho surgery, you might feel intimidated and you might get comments that might, you know, sound sexist. You don't have the, basically the, the you know, the power to, 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 to function in a department like ortho surgery. But honestly, it, it's nowhere near as bad as I thought it was going to be. People are generally very respectful respectful, um, very accommodating. I have, I'd be lying to say I have experienced any form of sexism in the workplace. Lovely, that's good to hear actually. Um, and surprising, like you've said, I'm, I'm a bit, I'm impressed, yeah. I'm happy, that's good to hear. Um, I don't see any more questions in the chat box. If there's a question that we may have missed, please just drop it in as quickly as possible before we wrap things up. Um, so that you know there we go <laughs> are nurses as mean as people always make them out to be are you still with us doctor hello i'm with you sorry i had a little that's okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, you say our nurses as mean as people always make them. Nurse, nurses are honestly, sorry, sorry, you guys lost me on video. Nurses are supposed to be your best friends. Like, honestly, they are the plugs because they are happy to teach you work. They make the workplace um, uh, bearable if you guys are friends you know I think it's, it's it's a good trick just to try and befriend them lend their names uh, be polite be respectful um, I, I don't think you know I don't think it's it, it would be fair to generalize some nurses are mean just because people can be mean but I don't think it's a all nurses are mean type of thing you know but definitely, I, I found it to be a very uh, good trick just to befriend, nurse, befriend nurses and be amicable with them. It usually works in your favor. Yeah. Mm. And we have another question. I saw this question earlier. I think we might have missed it. It's, what is the Botswana Doctors' Union exactly? Pardon? The Botswana Doctors' Union, what exactly is that? Um, so Botswana Doctors Union is just an association of doctors that advocates for, I shouldn't speak like this, like they sponsor me or anything, but <laughs> I've just done my little due, <laughs> I've done my due diligence. I've, I've just researched them a little bit. So I think they advocate for the well-being of doctors, um, on a large scale, really from stuff as little as trying to get us paid better to, um, speaking for us on a public platform. So anything that concerns us, anything that affects us, they are representatives, um, our mediators as well between the ministry and us and that sort of thing. So, yeah, I think they've, they've had an opportunity to be much more vocal now in the face of COVID than ever before. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we've got another question from Tato. It might be a bit touchy, so if you are uncomfortable answering that, please do not hesitate to let us know. It says, as a female doctor, have you ever ha had any experience of sexual harassment from colleagues or patients? Oh, that was hmm. a <laughs> <laughs> um, Unfortunately, I think as women will always be subject to being objectified 
even in a professional environment. Um, so you, you, you will be approached. Some people will be more civil about it and you will still have some people who will be very reckless with it. Um, I have never had it go to a point of har like actual harassment, but I have had experiences of people who have been very uh, unprofessional in a work setting in terms of making advancements, you know, but it's never been a situation where it's made me feel un completely uncomfortable and hindered me from functioning. Right. And is there, um, what's the culture like in hospitals there? What happens when something like that happens? Is it just something that's ignored and put on the back burner until it progresses? Yeah. Yes. It's absolutely ignored. Like, yeah, you can just imagine, you can just imagine how life in Botswana generally works. So it's just, it's just one of those things. If, if, if you're not, um, if you're not okay with it, you can say it and hopefully it doesn't escalate to a point where you're actually being harassed. If you're harassed, I should believe that you're, um, you should be in a position to report it and that the due diligence will be done. But um, as I said, I've never, I've never been in that situation. Thank God. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, no more questions. Please tap them quick, quick, quick so <laughs> before we wrap up. Um, but yeah. before we do, Anna, thank you so much for your time. Um, is thank there you so much. That you might want to add, I think we're all medical students here, um, that you know you might think for whatever we decide to do, or we decide to stay or come back. Any yeah. words for us? So I think if this is the closing, just in closing, um, especially for, okay, I guess for everybody, the first thing that I would just want to share is financial stewardship, just financial um, intelligence. We don't really have financial classes in, in school growing up, primary school, middle school, that sort of thing. So while you're there, while you're still in university, before you work, please um, invest in your financial education so that you are better prepared by the time you start earning money. Um, I'm just saying this because nobody has ever taught us what to do with money. So you, when you when you start getting paid, you know, we are more susceptible to making mistakes. Of course, nobody can really dictate to you how you spend your money, but I think just understanding the science of money a little bit better is a good um, is a good way to to develop yourself. Um, secondly, I'll just say make sure you're goal orientated. It may not be for all of us, but I do think for a good majority as medical doctors, we aspire to be specialists, some even subspecialists. So make sure you remain goal orientated. Um, I don't want to say this blatantly earlier, but please don't be controlled by the government. Don't wait for the government. If the government is not sponsoring you within a year, within two years, find other means, find other means, stay researched, stay, stay um, updated about what other countries are willing to offer you, um, about what scholarships are out there, what fellowships are out there, um, and just make sure that it, you don't get derailed by the system that you'll find here because you will, you will get absorbed and you will get comfortable just being a medical officer and find that your initial goals of maybe specializing become um, forgotten. And lastly, don't lose your light, especially if you've studied abroad and you've had this exposure to, you know, this, this beautiful life, this advanced life, this fast life. Don't come to Botswana and lose your light just because your physical setting is different. Stay positive, stay driven, um, stay within your magic. I think that's all. I love that. Stay within your magic. That's beautiful. Mm. Thank you so much for those kind words. Um, and where can we find you? Um, where can we see your work? Okay, so I'm on LinkedIn for more professional um, stuff as Aune Ditira. I'm on Instagram at Aune dot Ditira. YouTube, Aune Ditira. Twitter, Aune Ditira. Facebook official Aune Ditira. Thank you very much, guys. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Yes, girl. More content creator here, guys. We need to give her coin. She needs to make coin outside of medicine. So please do your due diligence. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, thank you. I think if no one else has anything to say, please feel free. It's a very informal session. If you want to switch on your mic, 
and maybe say thank you to Dr. Aone or anything like that. Um, we do hope that this has been beneficial to you guys. Please visit the websites that Dr. Aone mentioned earlier. Um, you know, do your research so that you're prepared. It's always better to be prepared um, when walking into these things and you know what you're doing. And um, yeah, you guys are gonna be amazing practitioners. If you are practicing to be doctors, we have faith that you will um, do amazing things. Um, please, please, if you have not already subscribed to our website as The Runway, do so we offer so many more services and we have so many much oh english we have a lot planned for you guys basically and we'd love for you guys to be a part of that um so if you've got an email from us there should be a link to the website um hop on that we have a facebook page as well as the global runway so do that and uh, hopefully we'll see your beautiful faces again dr Aune, thank you so thank very you much for time. thank you so much for having for having me i didn't expect to come out so fulfilled. Um, thank you for having me and giving me this opportunity to share. And I do hope that it has impacted all of you guys in a positive manner. Absolutely. Uh, I can speak for myself and say that it really has. Um, you've answered very important questions that a lot of us actually don't know where to find the information from. So I um, mm. really appreciate your time. Great.